Hey everybody, uh, today we're going to be talking about SE Linux. So SE Linux is a utility or actually a technology that comes with Red Hat Enterprise Linux and is there to make sure that applications don't do things they're not supposed to do. Um, Nate, what's everyone's favorite thing to do with SE Linux? Well, listen, I read in the documentation that I'm supposed to just turn it off. Isn't that what I'm supposed to do with SE Linux? Turn it off! Which don't is turn it off, yeah. Right. So we're going to be taking a closer look at some of the workings of SE Linux, um, and we'll do some examples. So let's just dive right in to the terminal. All right, so um, the first thing that we're going to talk about is how do we know whether SE Linux is running or not? So I like to use a command called SE status, um, and SE status will give us a whole bunch of information. Uh, the things that are most important are this, so SE Linux on this machine is in enforcing mode. It is enforcing its policy. Uh, the other thing that is interesting is this. What policy is it enforcing? So let's just take a, a slight step back. Um, a policy is a collection of rules. And so what's happening is when an application tries to do something on the machine, um, it will check that list of rules before we allow the application to proceed with whatever it's trying to do. So for example, maybe an application is trying to read a file. So the file read request goes to the kernel and the kernel will then check the SE Linux policy to see if that application is allowed to access the file that it's referencing. And if it is permitted, then it hands off the file just like it normally would. And if it's not permitted, then it will error back to the application saying you're not allowed to do this. So uh, we are using the targeted policy, which is the default for Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And the reason it's called targeted is because it targets specific applications. So it's not for everybody, it's just for specific things. Are there, are there other policies that people should care about or is targeted just kind of it and? So we do ship with other policies, but I would stick with the default especially if you're like new enough to SE Linux that you're watching this and being like, yeah, this is my first instruction. Stick with the default. Target yeah. policy actually like meets a lot of the needs that, that we have out there. Um, so let's start with that. And then maybe a bajillion years from now, we could talk about like crafting your own policy and a bunch of other things. All right. So um, in my description of what we're looking at here in SE status, I talked about kind of the loose flow of how we check stuff out and that a policy is really just a collection of rules. Well, if we have a collection of rules, then we have to know how to identify things. And so it turns out that we have this thing called a context that is assigned to every application and a whole bunch of system resources. And we can inspect these contexts, which are really just labels, um, by using a variety of commands. And a lot of them are commands you already know. So uh, if we want to take a look at the contexts of all of our applications, PS is how we look at process status information. But I want to call your attention to the capital Z option. That's usually the option you'll see used for inspecting SE Linux things. And so what we're looking at here is all the running processes and the first part of the line, this is its SE Linux context. And a lot of them on this machine are kernel-based, but I'm going to use grep to filter those out. So I'm going to run the same command again, but do grep-v kernel t. All right. And a good, um, good note is that a lot of informational commands like ls and whatever have a Z flag that will be specific to SE Linux. It's not unanimously true, but a lot of them do. Right. Um, so we can see here we have a machine, or this machine is running a web server, and those web server applications are running with HTTPD type um, context. And then my shell over here, this is an unconfined service. So that means that um, even though we check the policy, there's basically no rules that affect unconfined services, so they can do what they want. Um, if I look up here, SSHD is running as the SSHD type service, right? And so we talked about how pol uh, targeted policy targets specific applications, and we could see that it's targeting things like SSHD, web server. Uh, if I looked further back, we'd see crony. 
um, a whole bunch of different system applications are targeted, but things like my shell session, unconfined, right? Not targeted, not really covered by the targeted policy. All right. Uh, not only do processes have contexts, but other things do too. So for example, and we'll work on this uh, later in our example, network ports. Network ports have context. Whoops. Helps me spell the command right. And if you put it in the right order. This is what happens when we don't copy and paste, mate. <laughs> All right. This is fun. so. This um, is yeah. Zebra, we can do routing <laughs> and Zabbix and XFS. And nice. because we're going to be working a lot with uh, HTTPD today, um, now I want to know what ZOP is. No, you don't. <laughs> there we go. Um, you can see that these are the contexts assigned to these different ports. And so again, when we're checking the list of rules, we'll say things like, is a application with this context allowed to access a port with this context? And so you could see that the Apache ports that we typically use for web stuff um, are HTTP port T type uh, contexted. And so not, not surprisingly, the rules in the um, SE Linux policy say, if we're an HTTPD type application, we can access an HTTP port that's been set out there. But if we attached uh, HTTPD to a different port, like port 22, which is an SSHT context port, that probably is not allowed by the policy. All right, and then the last thing I'm gonna show you for context is files. So uh, just like before, we have dash capital Z. That's usually the option we see used with inspecting SE Linuxy things. Um, and we're gonna look at Etsy HTTPD. And so files and directories also have contexts. So you can see that there's a context of HTTPD config type on all of these things that would be configuration files for Apache. Um, so in the policy of rules, there's probably a rule that says if you're an HTTPD type application and you're trying to access a file and it's HTTPD config type, that's okay. But maybe uh, it does not allow access to these bin T type files. And so when we're trying to do things like grab that index HTML to serve out to someone, we make that file request, the kernel is going to check the policy of rules to see whether the context on the file you're trying to access through the web server and the list of rules allow that access to occur. All right. So that's, uh, that's where we're going to stop the critical path. Um, but a couple of rules to live by with SE Linux. Uh, because we use the targeted policy, it looks for specific services. My first rule is put things where they normally go. Because we've crafted this policy of rules based off of the um, applications that ship with Red Hat Enterprise Linux and where we think their stuff goes, right? So for Apache, as an example, put it in var www. That's where Apache stuff goes. Um, or for home things, put them in slash home. That's where we expect home directories to be. Uh, and if but you Scott, deviate I, I from that- I know better. I know better. Yeah, it belongs I'm, elsewhere. <laughs> you can deviate from that. In fact, that's what we're going to do after the uh, after yes, transition yes. is we're going to like start making customizations and see what happens. Um, but if you don't want to mess with SE Linux and you still want an enforcing for the protection that it provides, just put things where we expect them to be. And as right. though by magic, stuff will typically work. Um, the that other is true. rule, The other rule is- when you're looking at your default configurations, the more exotic you want to make your configuration, the more likely you are to run afoul of SE Linux, right? When you do things like change port numbers, well, we saw earlier SE Linux has like, these are the ports I expect these applications to run on. So as we're in our configuration, we're changing those ports, that may run us afoul of SE Linux. Um, 
And then we'll see a couple other settings that we can see as well. But things like interacting with network-based file systems or other stuff, that can that can also sometimes cause us to run afoul of SE Linux. But usually there's some uh, controls for that. All right, Nate, uh, before we transition, any, any further thoughts? Uh, I just want to note that last week I was able to deploy an entire WordPress uh, site in the five minutes that we are allotted for the critical path. And we're now 15 minutes in. <laughs> That's fine. You know why? It's because your um, containerized WordPress was running as container T, which has a completely different SLS policy set. <laughs> so there. All right, stay with us as we get more into SE Linux and we start talking about implementing those changes and those uh, putting things in the not default places, changing to the more exotic configurations where we can see what SE Linux requires for us to do. All right. So um, now is the time, of course, where we can answer questions from the audience. I saw there was a whole bunch of chat going on. So um, there was. A lot of it was just right. back and forth. There was one question in there. Um, I don't know if we want to cover it right now or if we wanted to wait, but maybe it's a good time. Let me see if I can scroll back and find it here. Hey, right, there it is. It's on the screen. How can I query which targets are available? That came from Okay. Frank. So this is this is actually a question about nomenclature. Um, so targeted is the policy name. The context. And let's go ahead and jump back into the terminal and I'll, I'll go quickly on like what the context is. So this thing that you see highlighted there is the context assigned to this file. It has three, actually a potential of five fields. The user field, the role field, and the type field are the first three, right? And that's why you see the U, R, mm -hmm. and T after each of the uh, tags that are in there, right? User role type. And then there's two additional fields called sensitivity and category, which you don't see here displayed, um, which are additional user definable fields. The targeted policy that we use for RHEL only looks at that third field, the type field. All right, so Frank's question was, how do I, how do I know what the types are? Um, and the answer is really horrible. Uh, you just look. And um, these are actually like defined uh, by us, by in when we build the policy, what these are going to be. So um, we use tools like PS dash capital Z to look at the type or the contexts assigned to applications, or LS dash Z to look at the context of our files, or a SE managed port list to see the contexts on the ports. So really you just kind of have to uh, monkey around with those tools. Um, there are some ways to like dump out the policy. Um, I was monkeying around with it last night and was like, that's way too complex. I don't want to show that to people because they will run away screaming with their hair on fire. Yeah, I mean, the, the um, policy is essentially a configuration file inside of Etsy SE Linux. So, you know, <laughs> have a blast looking at it if you want to. <laughs> Well, but it's not because it's actually compiled and uh, oh, it's binary. Things, right? I must be thinking yeah, yeah. of you. You can add to the policy, and that's not compiled, like your custom rule set. Correct. But that's maybe Which, a topic for another episode. It ends up being compiled. You you just don't have to compile it yourself. But it, it exists there in plain text that you can look at. Is what I mean. Yes, 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 yes. Um, and so one of the things we're talking about, Nate, you're going to be gone next week, right? Indeed. All right, so I'm just going to make the command decision. Bam. Next week, we're going to talk about SE Linux troubleshooting. Um, and maybe we'll talk about looking at the policy and like reading it because we're going to get some error messages and some other things with SE Linux troubleshooting. And it might be interesting to kind of interpret what the policy is telling us. So, um, Frank, tune in next week. I, I will show you, you the go. hideousness of SE Linux policies. Take it to the bank. That's a promise. <laughs> Only because I'll be at an airport. <laughs> That's right. Because Nate's in transit. All right. Uh, so I said the two rules were put things where we expect it to be. And the more exotic your configuration, the more likely it is to cause problems with you and SE Linux. 
So what are we going to do? We're going to put things where we don't expect them to be and make exotic configurations to mess ourselves up. That's what we're going to do. And we're going to use everybody's favorite example service, which Shantanu already guessed in the chat. <laughs> yes, we're going to use HTTPD. The reason that we use <laughs> HTTPD, by the way, um, is because a lot of people understand how it functions. Yeah. Um, and it's really easy to like get diagnostic data out of it, either through the web browser or logs. Um, that and is a lot harder to do with things like NFS. It's super simple to get installed and running too. I mean, out of the box, it'll do a thing and put up the test page, right? There's really nothing that has to be done other than install it and turn it on. Right. So um, let me show you what I did right before the show. Uh, I created my own directory for my website, right? And it's called slash website, right? Because why wouldn't we put a website at slash? Yeah, it makes makes sense. Perfect sense. Website um, and slash and website. Exactly. And uh, in website HTML, uh, there's my index file for my website. Is it super business? It is super businessy. <laughs> um, so when you look at the permissions, you can see that it has read write for the root user, read only for the root group, and all others, including the Apache user account, get read only. Right. Um, but also, what we'll notice is that there is a SC Linux problem here because when we put our directory and contents in place. It wasn't in a place that we normally put it. Usually web stuff goes over in var www. And if we look at the contexts on files over in var www, uh, actually let's do that and HTML, that. Um, you can see that the context of the index file over in var www is the third field, that type field is HTTPD syscontent t. So when we try to grab that index file, um, the Apache daemon makes a request to the kernel to access the file. The kernel goes into the SC Linux policy, goes, okay, you're a process type HTTPDT. Oh yeah, it's cool for you to access HTTPD syscontent t type files. No problem. Here's your file you wanted. Whereas over here in website HTML, it goes in and says, okay, you're a process HTTPD type and you're going to access root T files. Nope. Can't so do you're that. Going to refuse for it. Right. So even though the right. permissions are right, the SC Linux policy is going to stop you from doing it because the Apache type applications aren't allowed access to this non Apache type. But the thing to remember here, right? Like this might be a pain in the butt when you're setting up your website. You're like, why does it have to be like this? Imagine that you didn't intend HTTPD to be able to read slash website. And instead this is an attacker who's, who's, who's escaped your web application and they're now browsing around your file system. But they're doing it through the HTTPD process, which doesn't have rights to anything outside of our www, which is exactly what it should have access to, right? So the chance that they're going to be able to steal sensitive data from your server or even write things that are going to then let them escalate whatever permissions that they have, uh, they get blocked by SE Linux. So, you know, there's a lot of website vulnerabilities that are mitigated simply by having SE Linux on, and you didn't have to do anything other than make sure you had the right context set on your web route. Right. So we could fix this issue by going into the SC Linux policy and giving the Apache daemon type running applications root T access to files. But if we do that, then not only is it giving access to slash website, it'd be giving access to slash user, slash bin, slash TMP, slash var, slash confidential data, right? So anything that runs out of that top level directory would now be contexted in such a way that the Apache daemon could, could get a hold of it. And that's not what we want to do, right? We still want to run it in this kind of constrained configuration where it can access the web content that we intend. But if it tries to wander off outside of that, even by accident, because of a stray symbolic link or something else, 
um, it'll be precluded from accessing that data we did not intend it to get. All right, so uh, how about a better way to fix this problem? Um, so we could, there's actually a command called chicken for changing the context of a file, um, but that would only change this file or this directory. And as we added more content in here, it would still get the mismatched context when it was created. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to add to our policy a listing for slash website so that when we create content in slash website, it's automatically assigned the right HTTPD type contexts. All right, so I'm going to run this really awful command and I'll explain it in just a second. In fact, I'm going to copy and paste this awful command because I learned my lesson from earlier. And yeah, I'll get it in the wrong order this time. I'll do what I want. <laughs> command decision. Right. Oh, no. Now my copy paste isn't working. No. Ah, no. <laughs> Foiled again. I get it. <laughs> All right. We'll just do it the old fashioned way. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to manage your SE Linux policy using the SE manage command. And we're going to set a, we're going to add, that's what the minus A does. We're going to add a new file context. And the file context we're adding is slash website and anything underneath the slash website. So that thing in uh, parentheses is basically a regular expression that will allow anything that's created underneath of slash website to also get this file context. And anything inside of slash website is going to be file contexted type HTTPD syscontent T. All right. So that takes a little bit. You know why? Because it's being compiled, Nate. Boom. Yeah, but whatever. Go look in Etsy, uh, SE Linux uh, policy, I think. You'll find a... <laughs> <laughs> You'll find a text file. A, it is a text copy of the policy that's loaded just as binary. That's true. All right. Yeah. So what we could do to, to actually see this um, out there is we can sc manage f context dash l. That's all the file contexts. So how about we uh, also wrap HTTPD. All right, and this one down here at the bottom. There you go. That's what we just added, right? And we can see that there's others like var www scrolled off the screen, but it's in there. The var www openshift stuff is in there. var www Perl, because Perl is Nate's favorite programming language. That's in there too. Yeah. Uh, it's a version. Yeah, like all that stuff. Um, they all have this H, these contexts that are HTTPD types. var www svn. Wow, there's a lot of there's a lot of things that are accounted for in here. <laughs> well, because honestly, uh, back in Rel four, we yeah. shipped some version, and that was like the thing. That was like pre yeah. Git. Yeah, uh, so right. I, Git didn't exist yet. SVN was the thing that gave us all nightmares. I mean, the thing that we all stored our code in. Well, yes, because it was better than CVS. <laughs> uh, CVS was the thing that gave us all nightmares. <laughs> All right, but so we added the definition for our context to our file context configuration. But right when we look in slash website um, right there, that's still not right. So the other thing we're going to do is restore con recursive on website. All right, and that goes through and fixes everything. Now, what's really cool is if I go into website, HTML, um, there we go. That's businessy enough, right? How many times can you type business without typoing it? Uh, notice that my new file here, business HTML, thanks to our context configuration, 
right. it automatically got the right type, right? So we had to like go back and fix all the stuff that we had there before that was the wrong content type. Right. And now that we add more stuff there, it'll be cool. Yep. So SE Linux does not go through and reapply contexts simply because you added that to the policy. You have to tell it to do so. However, if it's already there, it'll inherit is really what this comes down to. That's what that restore con was all about. Okay. So um, let me just double check my SE Linux status again. All right, we're in enforcing, that's good. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn off my screen share and I'm gonna show you the website that is being served out of there. So I'm gonna turn off my screen share. It better be awesome. I mean, it's gonna be as awesome <laughs> as it can be. <laughs> as awesome as your as your skill set uh, allows for. <laughs> hey now, I was a developer at one point. All right, now let me turn it back on again. So there we go, Nate. There's our super businessy yep. website. That's sort of slash website, right? So thanks to me <laughs> changing the context, we didn't get a permission denied error. Yay! All right. So the other um, the other exotic configuration I want to cover today is changing your uh, port. Let me share my screen again. There's also more advanced fun things that you can do with stuff like if HTTPD is allowed to connect to, say, a database backend or if you're setting up an Nginx reverse proxy, if it's allowed to connect to the remote port, right? These are, there's all SE Linux booleans that allow or disallow that, and they're all off by default. So if you're ever trying to set up a site or a proxy or something, and you're like, why do I keep getting permission denied whenever I try to do this thing that should totally work and is set up in the configuration, check SE Linux. <laughs> all right, so what we're gonna do here is we're gonna listen on port 178. And I'm going to make sure that my super businessy website, it also listens on port 178. Watch the eye. I <laughs> like an errant insert. <laughs> All right. So, uh, system CTL restart. All right. Wrong, wrong, wrong. It actually, yep. It'll actually fail to start now because it can't bind to the port. Right, and if we take a look at the error log or errors that it suggests by using this journal CTL command. Yep. All right. Um, so we get it uh, listening and then it basically, the error log actually doesn't say anything specific, but if we take a look at uh, var log messages, System CCL status might give you something. Yeah, this kind of stuff here with like SE troubleshoot stuff like that. That's yep. all all the zhuzh. Um, now there's stuff you can talk about when you talk about troubleshooting that'll take those things from the audit log and translate them into policy changes. Hey, 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 hey. no spoilers for the episode. I, You're not I'm not I'm not gonna I'm not gonna spoil it. I'm just saying. Look forward to next time. <laughs> all right. So this is the actual uh, error message, right? SE Linux is preventing HTTPD from name-based access on port 178, which is not super surprising because we know that when we attach, when we have an application running as a certain context type, it's going to try to attach to a port. We got to check the policy of rules to see whether it's allowed or not allowed to attach to that port, right? And so from earlier, Now you might be asking like, I'm the admin, I've told it to connect to that port. Why, why would SE Linux stop that? Why would there be configuration that prevents me from doing that? I'm gonna go back to the same old attacker argument I had before. If a process was spun up by your Apache service, uh, like a sub process that's meant to listen on a port, you probably don't want that to happen because it's usually a sign that there's bad things going on. Without SE Linux, that could happen if your website is configured in a way that might have allowed that through some security vulnerability. This would prevent it. 
All right, so if we look at the HTTP ports, um, notice the port 178 isn't listed in there. So as we check the rules, it's like, okay, Apache's trying to attach to port 178. Oh, but wait, port 178 is not one of the allowed ports. So no thank you, All right? Which again, we can change. So I'm gonna use SE Manage again uh, to add, whoops, to port add a type HTTP port T, right? That's what I saw up there in the list that we got earlier. And I wanted to do a lot of TCP connections on port 178. All right, so now when I look at that SE managed port list, port 178 is in there. And Yay. if I systemctl restart Apache, It's running, no problem. No error. Right. And if I actually went over to my web browser, but I don't want to monkey with the screen share back and forth again, um, I could change the URL to connect to port 178 and we'd see the super businessy website being asserted out of slash website. So there was a quick question. Um, Siraj asked it, I believe. If we copy content, will it inherit the policy from the parent directory? And if we use move, will it will the same policy? Yeah, will it use the same policy from the directory we copied? Okay. So, and so, I, I I attempted to answer, but I don't know if you want to clarify. I basically said copy will inherit, move usually won't, unless you've told copy to preserve permissions. Right. So um, let let me like tell you what's really happening when you do a copy. Right. Remove. Right. When you do a copy, you're creating a brand new file somewhere else and then shoving all the same stuff into that file. But because you created a brand new file somewhere else, it inherited the context of where it lives. Whereas when you move a file, you're taking the file as exists today, including all of its permissions, ownerships, and SE Linux contexts, and shifting it somewhere else into another directory. And so a copy creates brand new files and then puts the right data into them. But because it's brand new, it got a fresh set of contexts when it was created. It also got fresh permissions and fresh ownerships based off of who's making the copy. And when you move a file, you're taking all that metadata about the file with it, including the SE Linux context. So if you move it, it may have the wrong context because you took it from one place that didn't have the context you needed and put it somewhere else. And now there's a context mismatch. So that's where RestoreCon is also really handy. Because if you run RestoreCon, where the, that move ended up, it will recontext the file to be appropriate for that location. Right. Cool. All right. Um, they, I just have a couple other small things for SE Linux. But Scott, we're already over. I I know, but <laughs> I'm the boss. I'm the boss of Eric, so I get to tell him. <laughs> and he just you said take whether this. You, you dictate whether we can actually put time into the show or not. So you get to say how long it is. Is that it? That's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, all right. So um, I also said not only exotic changes, right? Things like moving ports, right? Um, so just an aside before we jump into the next thing. Moving SE, uh, SSH from port 22 to something else is really common. Except... That's an exotic change, right? So you'll probably have to do some SLX port management for that SSH port move as well. All right. The other thing I want to talk about is some of the other um, changes that you can do for applications. Because applications aren't just standalone things. Sometimes they work with other applications. So for example, maybe our uh, document root that we're using, slash website there, is actually an NFS file share. Right? That's something we used to do back in the day. We'd like create one document route and put all of our stuff on it. And then we'd share yeah. it to a whole pool of web servers so that we could just change what was on the NFS share and then all the web servers would get updated content. Right, right. Except or you'd put all, all your websites on an NFS share and then mount each, you know, use specific subdirectories for different systems. That way you could back up one place. Yeah, I, I remember those days. They weren't always great. <laughs> they were, but like... NFS is a targeted service, which has its own jazz, right? 
So should Apache be able to access those NFS mounted file shares, which has its own SE Linux limitations? And so it turns out the default is no. But unlike having to recontext stuff, because there is that interplay between these two applications, there's another control mechanism that SE Linux uses for making changes. And it's called a Boolean. Yep. All right, Booleans are a zero or a one. It's either on or it's off. And these are things that are pre-configured in the policy, right? So when Red Hat wrote the policy for Apache, they put in these Booleans in their policy definitions. All right, we can look at all the Booleans by get se bool. Oops, dash A. This is all of them. Um, but we're only really interested in the ones for Apache today. So I'm going to do this and pipe it to grab HTTP. All right, and I want to draw your attention to this one. An Apache contexted applications use NFS. No, it's turned off. And SE Linux has thought of everything. Right. Now, I mean, we've had, um, gosh, like 20 years of, yeah. not quite 20 years, but close to 20 years of like working with this technology and manipulating it over time to make it more or less seamless as long as you abide by the rules of putting things where we belong and not doing exotic things. Um, yeah, I mean, the you know, the, the first time I can recall uh, turn off SE Linux as the first thing in a setup doc was probably like 2006 or seven. So yeah, yeah, well, it's almost 20 years. <laughs> so um, what we're going to do is we're going to set SE bool. HTTPD use NFS on. Right, and when we look at it, there we go. It's now on. But Nate, do you notice how fast that Boolean was switched? Yeah. It was fast. It was fast. fast. I bet it's not permeated into binary to use with the policy. That could be true. So when we just use set se bool, um, it changes it in memory only. Right. So there's another option. There it is, set se bool dash p to make it a permanent change. That took longer because it's compiling it and making it permanent so that when we reboot this machine, Apache right. can still use NFS directories, right? Um, so that's- And these that's are, these sometimes feel um, counterintuitive that you can set it and then it won't survive a reboot. However, it's really handy for troubleshooting. You know, if you're if you're like, oh, is that Boolean the problem? And you can toggle it and then, oh, that didn't fix it. And then you move on, but you never unset it. Right. SE Linux will revert that the next time you reboot the machine, which you could argue is a good feature. Yeah. So that's I think where we're going to end it today, talking a little bit about Booleans. Nate, any uh, any final words of wisdom on SE Linux? Uh, just that, uh, believe me, I was, I was in the SE Linux as a pain in the butt boat for a long time. And I think it was around the rel six days, right around when I got my first RHCE, which was certified on six, when we finally learned how to use it and how to troubleshoot it, that we decided as a whole, as an organization, the place I was working at at the time, we're going to start using this. And it was sort of a nightmare to begin with because we had so many applications where SE Linux was just off and we weren't, we were ignoring it. Um, so there was a bit of a curve there, but once we got it installed and once, or once we got it configured and learned how to work with it, it really saved our bacon a couple of times. I mean, we, we talked earlier about web applications that, uh, web application, um, vulnerabilities that are thwarted by SE Linux. We actually had one of those come through our organization that we didn't even have to patch it right away because SE Linux was protecting us. So it really can make your life easier. Uh, and Eric warns us that a couple of questions are coming in. Uh, I just wanted to like dovetail into that. Um, SE Linux is very mature now. Yeah. Right? So generally, if you put things where it belongs, you use default configurations, everything's cool. Yeah. Uh, the places where like Nate was talking about it being a nightmare, where I see people still struggle with it is they have like this 
legacy workload where people made decisions like we're going to put our websites in slash website. Um, right. And then they turn on SE Linux and they have problems because they made decisions that weren't in line with those rules of putting things where we expect it. Or it's no a, a completely custom code base, right? Some application that you developed in house that doesn't, that never considered SE Linux, right? That's going to be a difficult thing to get working because you're going to have to learn how to make that work within an SE Linux policy or write a policy to make it work, which is, you know, a uh, work. <laughs> Yeah, and we will not be covering making your own policy next week in right. troubleshooting SE Linux. That Why is not? like se several days of experience. <laughs> All right, uh, Eric has questions. Uh, does it make a difference whether I set bools with a set SE bool or SE manage bool? It does not. Um, so oftentimes there's a couple different ways to do things in SE Linux. Um, Set se bool is just the uh, the command line that I am familiar with, so that's the one I use. It's muscle memory for me. Yeah, and then there's there's also stuff like you talked about Chacon and um, se manage, right? Like those can both set a context, right? So it's another example of where things can sometimes uh, have two commands for one. Yep. All right, and. Uh, was there others? Uh, I'm curious about the reasons I still need to reboot my server for a permanent change. You don't. So right. I, maybe I misworded that. <laughs> yeah. So what we're talking about is like, let's say, and let's go back to the terminal here. Um, all right. I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do a terrible thing. Um, man, I'm having problems. Enforce. Bam, All right? I just turned it off, but I did not permanently turn it off. I turned it off in memory, right? If right. I take a look at um, my SE status, so we could see the current mode is permissive, but the mode from the configuration file is enforcing. So if I were to re reboot this machine, it would come back in enforcing mode, okay? Um, and so what Nate was talking about earlier is if we just edit the Boolean and we don't make it permanent, it changes it in memory, which means we didn't persist it to a file or a configuration that will be read at boot time. So we it's, would um, revert back to what its setting is. It's comparable to uh, firewall D. If you do a firewall CMD to open a port, but don't tell it to make it permanent, it doesn't get saved to the config right? So the next time you reboot, it goes away. Same concept. If you turn on or turn off a Boolean and don't make it persistent, then it'll happen actively. But as soon as you reboot, it goes away. So you don't have to reboot to make it persistent. You have to tell it to be persistent so that if you reboot, it comes back. Yeah. And um, talking about toggling the modes, I'll give you one last SE Linux. Uh, let's call it a tip. For RHEL 9 and later, do not fully disable SE Linux. Do not. Right. If you want to not run SE Linux, set it to permissive mode, but do not set it to disabled. Reason for that is because um, if you set it to disabled, your machine will not boot. Right. And it's very bad. So um, RHEL 9 and later, enforcing or permissive, those are your choices. Don't set it to disabled. You are capable as an administrator of doing that change. Don't do it. You will regret it. Um, so enforcing. And to, and to be clear, permissive is functionally like having it disabled. The difference is the policy violations get logged. So you can then check out the audit log later. It's a great way to troubleshoot. It's a great way to determine if a system that you're about to turn SE Linux on um, is ready for it because you can set it to permissive mode first, make sure all the contexts have been relabeled. In fact, I think that happens the first time you reboot after turning it from disabled to, to permissive. And then you can watch the audit log and see if anything's triggering. And if it is, you know that you have to fix stuff. But permissive won't stop things from happening. So you don't need to disable it, I guess, is the point I'm trying to make. 
Yeah, and uh, so just in chat, we were discussing it because everyone's like, what? When did that happen? Rel 9 and later, that's Rel what nine. happened. Yep. Um, and it has to do with like the um, kernel moving off of the initial RAM disk provided by the Dracut image to the file system. That's where it all comes apart. If you're in disabled mode, um, don't, don't do it. Permissive or enforcing. I forget what the technolo technological reason was that it had to do had to happen, but I think there it's because it we're tired of Dan Walsh crying himself to sleep at night from people disabling SC Linux. Well, that's valid. You know, we don't we don't want to hurt Dan Walsh. He's a nice guy. Yes, we actually just <laughs> ran into him like a couple weeks ago. Yeah, we had to go halfway across, all the way across the country for me to, to do so. <laughs> oh, all right. Uh, did we have any other questions? Uh, there was one about where to find, um, I think it was from Conan Kudo, about where to find, there you go, where to find good documentation to get better with SE Linux. Uh, um, great question. I don't have an answer for you now. I will put it in the comments after we come off the air. I, I believe our security guide has some info on SE Linux, but it's not, it's not the in-depth stuff that maybe he's looking for. Yeah, and I think that, um, well, the security guide talks about using the commands like se manage. Right, and, stuff we uh, just covered. Or, yeah. right. But what it lacks is like how it all ties together, what the flow right. is for an application. And so I'll see if I can find something that that get. I bet there's a couple of blogs on redhat.com that are really good, but I'll have to yeah. suck them out and find them and I'll put them in the comments after we go off the air. Um, I saw one else uh, about app armor. So App Armor is a uh, alternative technology that's used by Ubuntu and SuSE, um, and maybe some other Linuxes as well. And it, it is the goal is the same to keep applications mm -hmm. from accessing, accessing things they shouldn't access. The configuration and implementation is entirely different. Um, my recollection, it's been a number of years since I've looked at it, is that it is not as uh, granular as SE Linux is, um, which may be good if you want simplicity, but if you have a lot of more stringent requirements, like users should be able to, this user should be able to access this file, but not that file. And I can't rely on permissions or the root user should be able to do these things, but not those things. You can do that with SE Linux contexts and you can't do that with, um, with app armor is my recollection. So, Depends on what you're looking for. Uh, we've shipped SE Linux since RHEL 3 um, and have not shipped App Armor ever. And I don't see that changing. I've never touched App Armor, so I <laughs> completely unqualified to answer that question. I'm glad you have some experience with it. <laughs> yeah. That, I mean, the idea behind App Armor is similar, but um, just another implementation used by different people. All right. Uh, Aaron asked, oh, I made a reference to compiling. Yeah, so because the SE Linux uh, policy gets checked all the time by the kernel, um, we need to make that as fast as possible. So yeah. the way that we make it as fast as possible is we compile a copy of it and load it in a memory for the kernel to reflect with or to, to check on. So um, when we do things like we look at the file in Etsy that Nate was referencing earlier, that is a file that was created when we installed the SE Linux policy, but things that we're changing using uh, SE Manage, for example, do not get reflected in those files because the files were a copy made at installation time of the policy. It's not the actual thing that uh, is used for enforcing the policy or documenting the policy. So everything that we make permanent um, in SE Linux goes into a compiled policy file. And maybe next week when we talk about troubleshooting, I'll kind of show you where that stuff lives. Um, but that that's why we're compiling things is so that we can put it into the kernel or into the memory that the kernel is using so that it doesn't have to access a file before it checks the policy, right? So it's able to look into memory and be like, yes, no, let's move on. Yeah, really what it comes down to is compiled data is faster for a computer to read than text data. But text data is, you know, human readable. So we kind of have to have both. But the one the computer reads is the one the computer's better at. And the one the human reads is the one the human's better at. <laughs> right. 
All right, so I think that runs us off the end. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe. I should have said that earlier before we transitioned. By yeah, apology, yeah. Eric. Do the things. Um, hit the buttons. Yeah, hit the buttons. And uh, <laughs> next week on ITT, I made the command decision. We're going to talk about troubleshooting SE Linux. Uh, yep. And then in two weeks, we're going to do um, running local virtualization. Yeah, we're going to do some virtualization on RHEL which is a thing that I've done a bunch of. I still do it today in my home lab. I used to run like clusters of KVM and Zen virtualizations, which still keeps me up at night, even though they're long gone. <laughs> and then also in two weeks, or we're early 10 days, um, RHEL Presents will be covering pods and containers and container definitions with Quadlet. So if you're interested in container stuff, uh, RHEL Presents has some interesting stuff coming up Wednesday in two weeks. Good stuff. Hey everybody, thanks for uh, tuning in. If you're a deferred viewer, don't forget to put uh, comments if you have questions. Uh, I yeah. took the action item of finding some good SE Linux stuffs and sticking it in the comments. So I'll put that on after we're finished. Um, and until next week, happy into the terminal. Have a great one, folks. <laughs>